Today, 1970 Plymouth GTX. This car is a viewer of the channel. He's also a friend of mine. We are going to dive in deep with this one. This one is probably has the most information of any video that I've done to date so far. And I'd like for you guys to chime in on the comment section. What did you like? What didn't you like? But before getting into all of that, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like. This channel, we feature the classics. Vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, especially the cars that are off the beaten path. We dive in deep, give specs, period correct ads, as well as perspectives that a lot of channels simply don't show. If that sounds of interest to you, subscribe, hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. Couple of announcements real quick. If you'd like to get in touch with me, drop me a comment in the comment section below. I respond to all comments posted. Uh, the other way is check out our Facebook group. It's going to be a car community. It gives you the opportunity to share your stories, share your rides. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a great place to see other people interact in the car hobby. I wish YouTube had that option on here, but for right now they don't. Maybe they'll make that option in the future. If you're interested in any of that information, the link will be in the description below. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, Put them in the comment section below. We're going to do an end of the year episode and kind of reflect on what the channel was like for this past year. And I think I'm going to do that every year from here on out. It's not going to be the anniversary of when the show started, but we'll just do a end of the year review type thing. What cars we did, what cars were the greatest, what cars kind of wasn't so great that was put up on a pillar. <coughs> Mercedes Benz 450 SL. Um, but anyway, yeah, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask me, I'll answer them and that, and that episode won't air for three months. So you have three months to come up with any questions, comments, or concerns before getting into the GTX. Let's take a look back at what Plymouth offered in 1970. These aren't in any particular order. Barracuda, Belvedere, Cuda, Cuda AAR, Fury, Fury Grand Coupe, Roadrunner, Roadrunner Superbird, Satellite, Sport Fury, Sport sa Satellite, Valiant, Duster, Wagons, and then there was the GTX. So what was the GTX? GTX stands for, let's take the GT part first. GT stands for Gran Turismo or Gran Touring. The X was added because this was the late muscle car era, and that's what people did. That's what sold cars. It was a marketing thing, like AMC, AMX or Datsun Z. Letters were just a thing. This was Plymouth's version of Pontiac GTO. So instead of it being GTO, Plymouth replaced the O with the X because X is better than O. I don't know. Anyway, Plymouth introduced the Belvedere GTX in 1967. It was positioned as a mid-sized car. It was sold as an upscale performance muscle car. Plymouth offered the GTX from 1967 to 1971 model years, and only a total of 44,178 GTX units were ever built during that time period. Despite its short production run, GTX had three generations. 1968 to 1970 is considered second generation. In 1970, the convertible was dropped, leaving the two-door hardtop the only available body design for the GTX. Built on Chrysler's B-body platform, other cars that share the same platform are the Dodge Challenger, Plymouth Belvedere, Plymouth Satellite. The 1970 GTX received minor redesign. It featured a new grille, new rear taillights, stylists made the line smoother for 1970, and they introduced the power bulge Hood, non-functional brake air scoops were added on the sides and the air grabber hood returned, but it was modified. Instead of the hood having two narrow openings that ran along the hood, it now featured one air opening at the top of the power bulge. Let's get into the specs. 204 inches long, 76.4 inches wide. It rides a wheelbase of 116 inches, weighs 3,520 pounds. Total 1970 Plymouth production was 747,508 units, of which 7,748 were GTX. This was the worst sales year for the GTX. Price, $3,530, which is equivalent to you spending $26,945.45 in the year 2022. 
NADA pricing guide, low retail, meaning it's missing parts. It may have mechanical issues, perhaps some interior flaws, $19,400. And it can go all the way up to $73,900. That is for a Concord's 100-point Pebble Beach car. And these are just baseline numbers. A lot of times with classics, it's worth what somebody will pay for, but this is a good place to start. Haggerty, according to Haggerty, the highest selling one to ever hit the market sold for $300,000, which is more than three times the highest price NADA has at $73,900. Like I said, it's just a starting point. Moving on to engines, three engine options to choose from. None of these are in the basement. 440 cubic inch displacement, Super Commando V8, 7.2 liters. 6,908 buyers bought the base engine 375 horsepower 4600 rpm with a bore of 4.6 inches a stroke of 3.8 inches compression 9.7 to 1 five main bearings wrapped in cast iron 9.5 miles per gallon average 0 to 60 5.5 seconds with a four speed stick that was according to automobile.com i saw another figure for 6.5 seconds 0 to 60 and a quarter mile at 14.9 seconds at 95.4 miles per hour, which would make more sense because that first figure is faster than the Hemi. Why would you get the Hemi if this one's faster? Just my opinion though. Moving up the scale, 440 six pack V8, 7.2 liters, makes 390 horsepower at 4,700 RPM, 490 foot pounds of torque at 3,200 RPM with a bore of 4.3 inches, a stroke of 3.8 inches, 768 buyers bought this option. The six-pack option was a $149 option, which equates out to $1,137.36 in the year 2022. Before moving on to the biggest and baddest engine offered, it, well, it wasn't really bigger, but it had more power. There is one thing worth mentioning. There was a caveat to getting the two bigger engines. Either you got the six-pack 440 or the Hemi, if you got either one of those, you could not get two of the options. The options were air conditioning and speed control. Also worth mentioning, if you got an air grabber option, you could not get air conditioning either because of where the ductwork had to go for the compressor, it would have been in the way. Anyway, moving on to the final engine on offer, 426 cubic inch displacement Hemi V8, seven liters. It makes 425 horsepower, 5,000 RPM, 490 pound feet of torque at 4,000 RPM with a bore of four and a quarter inch and a stroke of three and three quarters inch. The block is made of cast iron, but the heads were made of aluminum. Compression is 10, 25 to one. Only 72 Hemi GTXs were ordered from the factory because it had a $711 option price tag attached to it, which is, was equivalent to you spending $5,427.26 in the year 2022 for an engine that has the same pound feet of torque as the six pack engine, which costs a fraction of the price. 7.4 miles to the gallon is the average, 0 to 60, 5.7 seconds. Let's talk about this door panel. Look at this. This looks like uh, fake wood up here. Red, white, and blue accents. That's cool. Here's the armrest. Door handle to pull the door closed. This is the door handle to get out. That's how it operates. Here is the remote control mirror, but it's more like a toggle switch mirror control. Here's the vent window. This is the window crank for the big window. Just notice how that's all op how that all operates. And it's only trimmed out on the one side. And notice it has a little bit of a divot here so that it can come up here and connect. Coming down inside the pedal box down here, this is the emergency brake. The emergency brake releases up here. High beam switch is on the floor, brake pedal, gas pedal. This is for a vent. This is what over the hood impression looks like. Here's what, here's what first person looks like. And there's lots of space underneath the steering wheel. 
here's what the sun visor situation no courtesy mirrors on the driver's side there's no courtesy mirror on the passenger side either there's a rear view mirror it's got the daytime nighttime feature it says so right here it's advertised on the mirror this is what i look like behind the wheel lots of headroom as you can see these seats are very comfortable these seats are Here's a center seat. There's no center console, just an extra seat for another person. So this controls the hood scoop and it's vacuum operated. So it's, that's very cool. There's a seat belt light down here. Another vent, this is the vent for the passenger side. Vent for the passenger side, vent for the driver's side. Over here, this is where the ashtray is located as well as cigarette lighter. On to the button switches and knobs. Starting left, moving right, headlights. Right next to it is the panel dimmer switch. Right below the headlight switch is a handbrake warning light. Moving to the center of the steering wheel. Drive select modes. Park, reverse, neutral, drive, second, first. Aftermarket tack where the optional tack would be, speedometer, odometer at the bottom. Then you have four gauges off to the right hand side, fuel, temperature, oil pressure, amp gauge, windshield wipers, and washer. The washer is a totally different button than the windshield wiper button. Ignition is on the column. Just above the radio, right underneath the dash cover is right wind, and then in the center, is your temperature climate controls, mostly having to do with heat and ventilation. Off, heat is in the center, defrost is all the way to the right. There is another switch for the fan right next to that. There is a small button that controls the light that is right above the ashtray. All right, getting in the back seat. So let me just move the seat forward like that. Notice how far forward that seat goes. All right, sitting in the back seat. Lots of headroom back here. More headroom than I thought that there would be. It's actually really comfortable back here. The seat's more upright than I'd like it to be. Here is what the seat profile looks like. Notice it's pretty straight up. Here's what my knees look like. Over here, got a nice armrest with ashtray, as well as windows can go up and down back here. And this is how they operate. Look at this window, look how big this glass is. So that's what that looks like with the window up. It's got coat hooks here on each side, as well as window cranks and armrest and cigarette ashtray on both sides. Here is what the back view looks like. It's a really big back windshield as well as look at this shelf look at how big this shelf is this shelf is absolutely huge look i'm sitting in the back seat and i can't even i can barely touch the end of it here's what the front looks like from the back so just check out this back window notice it's not completely straight look at how it it's kind of interesting notice this line Right here, right off the back. The more you look at this car, the more subtle details you see. Getting underneath the hood, this car has the base 440, four barrel carburetor, Super Commando V8. Notice the windshield washer reservoir tank right there, as well as the horns. Both horns are right there in that corner. This car has an alternator, it's also got power steering. Notice the distributor is in the front instead of the back. Chevy puts theirs in the back for some reason. Never understood why. This one has dual master cylinder for the brakes. But as you can see, this is a very clean and tidy engine compartment. 440 does not look huge in this car. On to the pros and cons. I generally get all of the pros and cons from the complete book of collectible cars, but the second generation GTX isn't in there for some reason, but the other GTX years are weird. 
68 through 70 isn't in there. So I compiled a list of the pros and cons taken from all the cars that are relatively close to the GTX because the GTX is very similar to a lot of other Plymouth offerings. That's why sales numbers wasn't as good as they could have been because they all kind of shared the same space. On the pros side, rare, high performance, Hemi is available, milestone car. One of the last high performance Plymouths Power really drops off after 1971. Cons, rust prone, fuel consumption, getting harder and harder to find a good, clean original. All right, it's time for Name That Tune. I'm looking for the correct name of the band as well as song title. First one to give me both of them correctly will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section. So a little bit of a clue that was on the hundred billboards, 100 chart topping singles hits of the year 1970. Anyway, thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. I really appreciate all of the support and until next time, toodle.